<clears throat> so I hope everyone had a good birthday. Did you recycle? Participate in, in cleanup or anything of the like? Neither did I. Well, I did recycle. <laughs> um, I've heard a lot of Christians, more than I'd like, say that God never called us to take care of this earth. After all, we're waiting for the next one. Why would we take care of this one? Isn't God just going to remake it when this one ends? So shouldn't we just hasten the end of the world with all the pollution and nuclear energy that we possibly can? Or with sugary soft drinks and hasten it individually? <laughs> I've heard this preached more than I'd like. And when I read the Bible, I can't say that I find it echoed there at all. Because when God made humanity, he placed us in a garden and told us, now it's your job to take care of this thing. And of course, we got kicked out because we didn't take care of it. And later on, God destroyed the world with a flood. And he told Noah and his family when they got off the ark, now it's your job to take care of this thing. And of course we haven't. But throughout the Bible, we see this call echoed that we're supposed to. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that would be God, of course, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people... Are without excuse. Paul tells us we should understand God not only through the scripture but through what God has made. Now of course if you're looking for the natural order that God has ordained through the nature of sea slugs you might be looking a little too closely but the thing is that God has ordained nature to teach us to lead us back to the idea that there is one creator, there is one God, and that he is present throughout. We see in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, that God says, I made the earth, I created the people who live on it. It was me, my hand stretched out the sky. I gave orders to all the heavenly lights. God in Isaiah is calling out to us through creation. And he's saying, I did all this. But not only that, but he ordained the heavenly lights. What does that mean? What did he ordain the heavenly lights to do? We see in another prophet, the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, but there is one who made the constellations Pleiades and Orion. He can turn the darkness into morning and daylight into night. He summons the water of the seas and pours it out on the earth's surface. The Lord is his name. Here, Amos is crying out, just as God does in Isaiah. And he's saying, look to the stars, look to the heavens. They proclaim the name of God. In the ancient world, there was this belief that God created not only us, not only the world in which we live, but God also created all the sun, moon, and stars. And the sun, moon, and stars represented all the gods of the world. We see this in the apocryphal book of Enoch, where they're called the Watchers. And the stars in Enoch's book are watching us. They're beholding God's creation. And when those watchers decide to abandon God, they sin. They turn away. And throughout the books of the Bible, we see them 
categorized as demons, or as Paul says, though there are Lord's many and God's many, unto us there is but one God. So he admits that there are other gods, but they're not worthy of our worship. Why? Because they're meant to point us to the one God. That's their job. They sit up there in the sky, they watch us, and they point to God. But God doesn't just rain down from heaven from the sky. It says in Psalm 104, he provides grass for the cattle and crops for people to cultivate so they can produce food from the ground. From the ground. And I think about that. I think of the psalm that says, if I ascend to the heights, Lord, I find you. If I descend to the depths of Sheol, into the grave, there, behold, you're there. For God produces life. He produces light from the sky and life from the ground. From the very grave that consumes us, God produces life. And so we have a world in every way, from the heights of the heavens to the depths of the grave, to the depths of the sea. All of it points to God because God is in all and above all. Luke tells us, consider how the flowers grow. They do not work or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed as one of these. Creation is made to serve us, and we live in an industrial culture, one that is very used to the idea that creation is made to serve us. But it's not just made to serve us. It's made so that we can find God, so that no matter how far away we go, no matter how far from nature we are, whether we are no longer wearing clothes spun from natural fabrics or even worshiping God in natural ways, if we are full of, if our entire life is dominated by electronics, if our work is industry, if we never see anything natural in this world except what we ourselves have made, consider that Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautifully as the lilies of the field. Even what we make points to the hand of God because everything we make it from came from him. And so we turn back to the word, as Isaiah chapter 40 says, the grass dries up, the flowers wither, but the decree of our God is forever reliable. Even though we're waiting for that new heaven, that new earth, we should forever be taking care of the one we have now. Not only because God decreed it, but because it is his creation, just as we are. So we should see in this world echoes of ourselves, echoes of what we have made. That when we see the lilies of the field, we see the most beautiful clothing we have ever made. When we see the grasses of the ground, we know that God is producing food, everything in this world calls us back to God. And so, just as Paul says, we are without excuse. We have to know God. We have to know that there is one God who is in all and above all, and that he alone is worthy of our worship. You know, as I was writing this, I was thinking, what practical difference does this make in our lives? 
And I don't know that it does. I think it's very high theology when we start talking about angels, when we start, start talking about how flowers point us to God. That it doesn't come back to the practical, really. But think of this. If God works every day, to produce the food of the ground, to produce the rain of the sky, to produce the light that gives us life, and even to comfort us in the life hereafter, then what, what work is it that he is calling us to? What work does God want from us? Consider that all these things point not only to God's nature, but to our calling. And so, let's consider what God is calling each one of us to as we pray. Father God, we thank you for this world that you have made, for the families you have placed us within, for this church family that we have found, Lord. Lord, we pray that we be good, good stewards of everything you have given us and that we continue to produce the goodness, the gentleness, and the generosity that you have produced within our lives, that we pay it forward, that we never cease to shine your light into the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen.